And before we spend some time in God's Word, let's just take some time to pray for the receiving of God's Word. So please join me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pause and we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together like Christians throughout the county and throughout the world who are living in this tension right now of remembering a Savior who walks in triumphantly, or rides in triumphantly to Jerusalem this week. And yet the end of his week is much different. And Lord, we sit with this kind of dual conflict of thinking through how to reflect on the cross, but also how to rejoice and that the tomb is empty. And so as people gather together throughout this week in homes, in churches, in the woods, in caves, to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen. We pray that our church here, the churches throughout the county, the churches throughout the world, whether there are three people hiding behind a locked door or 3,000 people proclaiming loudly in an auditorium, may you be glorified through our time of worship together. Lord, pray for Pastor James this morning as he shares the word with our brothers and sisters at Risen Church in Concord. May they be blessed by the word this morning and the words that he speaks this morning. Lord, I pray this morning as we look at Mark that you would give me the words to speak and you would give us the hearts and ears to receive. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. So in September of 1955, missionaries Nate Saint, Jim Elliott, Ed McCullough, Pete Fleming, and Roger Yoderin spotted in the air from a plane an Ecuadorian tribe that they had been looking for, known as the Alca, also known as the Harani, also commonly referred to as the Wadoni. The Wadoni people were a very isolated tribe in the jungles of Ecuador, and they were known for their violence towards outsiders as well as their violence towards those within their own community. And these five men desired to reach them to share the gospel. And they dubbed the program Operation Alka. Over the next couple of months, these men would take trips in their plane and they would drop gifts to the Wadoni Indians to share with them different gifts. It could be things like ribbons and matches and machetes, including pictures of themselves, trying to show that they were friends and interested in making contact with them. After several months, in January of 1956, the five men decided this was the time to go and make actual contact with the Bodoni tribe. So on January 3rd, 1956, the five men landed on a very remote strip on a small beach in the middle of the jungle in a river and hoped to make their first contact with the Bodoni. On January 7th, four days later, they made their first contact. Two women and a man from the tribe came through the jungle and spent some time with the five men. They hung out. They gave them gifts, including a, a model of the airplane that they had been flying in that was sitting on the beach right next to them. Two days later, on January 9th, there was a search that began in the Ecuadorian jungle because the men hadn't radioed into their home base. On January 11th, from the air, the first body was spotted, and what they thought would be a rescue mission quickly became a retrieval and burial mission. Within a few days, all five men were found. All five men were dead. You see, on January 7th, three Wadoni Indians came into the missionary camp, and when they returned to their own tribe, there was a disagreement. Two of them said they were mistreated by the five missionaries, and the third, instead of confronting their, um, their tribesmen, decided to simply go along with the lie and, and let it go. And so the next day, on January the 8th, a bunch of Wadoni returned as a war party and slaughtered the five men, spearing them to death. Nate Saint, 32, was married with three children. Jim Elliott was 28, married with one child. Ed McCullough was 28, married with three children. Pete Fleming was 27, married with no children. Roger Yodern was 31, married with two children. Five men dead. Five women, now widows, nine children left without families. Some called the event a tragic waste. 
the death of five men at such a young age, some in the world simply saw as a wasted life. In Mark, we're introduced in chapter 1 to another man in his early 30s. It's referred to as John the Baptist. In Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, we're told that John appeared, baptized in the wilderness, and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him, or being baptized by him in the river, Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, ate locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So this man in his early 30s is in the wilderness preaching repentance, preaching one is coming who's greater than I, that is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit, that the Messiah is coming. And then we're told in just a few verses later, look at Mark 1.14, it says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. That's all we get from Mark. John is in the wilderness preaching repentance, preaching baptism, preaching that one is coming with the Spirit. And a few verses later, we're told he's arrested. And that's all we get from Mark on John until our passage this morning in Mark chapter 6. And so if you have your Bibles, we encourage you to turn over to Mark chapter 6, because all we know is John is arrested, John is in prison, and in our passage this morning, Mark tells us what happens to John. Mark 6, verse 14 through 16. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers at work in him. But others said he's Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. We're told in verse 14 that Herod heard of it. We're not told exactly what the it means, but what we can infer from the context is the it is some form of the ministry of Jesus. Word is getting around that Jesus has been preaching. He has just sent his followers out, his disciples, to preach and proclaim, and some type of message is getting back to Herod. And Herod is confused. John is dead because John has been executed by Herod. That's the first thing we're told about John since the passage we read in chapter 1. And Herod is wondering if this is John back from the dead. Herod has a very high view of John, and yet Herod had John executed. And Herod now thinks John is back. If Herod had such a high view of John, why did Herod have John imprisoned? And why did he have him executed? Let's keep reading. Verse 17. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John. So back in Mark 1, Herod is the one who sent him out to be arrested. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. All right, so let's just give the backdrop. Herod's got a wife. Herod's got a half-brother, Philip, who has a wife named Herodias. Herod takes a liking to his half-brother's wife, and Herod decides to divorce his wife and convince Herodias to leave Philip and run off with him. So now Herod and Herodias are in this marriage, and John says, this is sinful, probably proclaiming from Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, that based on the relationship that Herodias has with Philip, Herod, this should not be your wife. Herodias, you should not be married to Herod. You two are living in sin. It's a sinful union. And John has confronted the sin. And he confronted it boldly, and it's landed him, we're told in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, in prison. This is the backdrop of Mark 1.14. And there he sits in jail. The king likes to hear from him. The king respects him. But you're really at the mercy of the king because you never know when the king may grow tired of you. And one day the cell doors are going to fling open. 
and John is sitting in his cell, wondering if they're there to feed him, wondering if Herod is summoning him again, wondering why they're there for John. But it's none of that, because it's Herod's birthday, and Herod has decided to throw himself a birthday party. And birthday parties at this time were associated greatly with drunkenness and ungodly behavior, and Herod has sown himself one wild party. He's inviting all the VIPs. He's included a, a not suitable for work dance from his wife's daughter, Herodias' daughter, and he throws one wild party. Verse 21. An opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the lady men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask? And she, she being her mother, said, Head of John the Baptist. And she, she being the daughter, came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Herod is enjoying his party. He's living large. He's the man of the hour. And he boastfully makes a promise that his wife jumps at. So the cell doors have flung open, John, and they're not here to feed you. They're not here to hear from you. They're here to fulfill a twisted command. They're here to fulfill a twisted order, and that's it. The forerunner of John, of Jesus, that was promised back in Malachi, this man in his 30s whose crime was simply confronting sin, is dead. Head on a platter for the amusement and awe of some party guests, Head on a platter for the pleasure of a woman who doesn't want her sin called out. That's it. Early 30s. Like Nate Saint, like Jim Elliott, like Ed McCullough, like Pete Fleming, like Roger Yodrin. Dead. And the world sees things like this and thinks, what a waste. What a loss. Men who either had no children or missed out on the pleasures of seeing them grow old, no arrival of grandchildren, no retirement where you can play unlimited golf, no exotic travel, no 50th wedding celebration with generation upon generation around you to celebrate your faithfulness. Uh, it's all gone, just like that. And the world looks and says, this is a shame. What a waste for someone to be cut down so young. Unnecessary. Men who died needlessly, the world would say, for living boldly for God, for desiring to see God glorified in and through them. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul tells us, he tells the church at Corinth that the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Paul says, a lost, broken world will look at you if you want to walk in obedience to Christ and think it's stupidity. They won't get it. Lives cut down in their youth Risking for God is foolishness and stupidity to a broken world. It's a wasted life. Now, here's the thing. If you want to play it safe, if you want to avoid conflict, opposition, or hostility from a broken world, if you want to avoid the struggles of a John the Baptist or a Nate Saint or a Jim Elliott, it's simple. Just play it safe. Don't risk for God. Just disregard passages in your Bible like 2 Timothy 3.12. Just put a line through them where Paul says, look, you, those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In a few weeks, Pastor James will preach from Mark 8, 34 through 38, and Jesus will say, those who want to follow me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Jesus. Just cross that out. Don't worry about it if you don't want to risk being shunned by the world. Just play it safe for God. Disregard those passages. Go home 
have lunch and say, man, like, John the Baptist was pretty sold out, man. It's a shame what happened to him. And those five boys in Ecuador, man, I don't know what God was doing. That's pretty cool. But people are just different, man. Just sit lunch, eat, play it safe, and put them in the hall of fame as if they're otherworldly. Here's the problem. You could play it safe for God in this world, but safety is an illusion. It's fake. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. You can play it safe for God, but you can't play it safe in a broken world. It's an illusion. You're lying to yourself. You're but a mist. James says, you're like the steam on your bathroom mirror after a hot shower. You're gone like that. It's a sobering thought. Safety is such an illusion, but we should know this in this country. Three little nine-year-old girls went to school this week. Moms and dads kissed them goodbye in Tennessee, expecting to pick them up. And they don't come home. And three teachers don't come home with yet another tragic school shooting. Shooting in movie theaters, shootings in clubs. Shootings in schools, cars swerving the wrong way, genetics catching up to you. I don't tell you these things to scare you. It's the reality of a broken world we live in. So if you think you can just play it safe, brothers and sisters, you're lying to yourself. It's an illusion. It's a broken world, and it isn't safe. In October of 2009, Frank was at a men's retreat with his church, and he got up and went for a morning walk, just his normal morning routine, nothing crazy. He was struck by a motorist who didn't see him, and he died on the spot. Just like that, his wife of 47 years was a widow. His two children were burying him. His two granddaughters would never see Grandpa again. This was a man who loved his family well. This was a man who loved the Lord well. He served in churches for 30-plus years as a choir director. Went home to be with the Savior. Just going out for a morning walk. Frank's not a fictional character. Frank was the choir director in my church growing up. My family and I shared potlucks with Frank and his family. We shared services. We shared Easter services. We shared meals. We shared camps. To this day, one of the sweetest songs that I love in worship is simply the doxology. Sung every Sunday in my church growing up after the morning offering, Frank would stand up and lead us. I can still close my eyes and see him in his three-piece suit. Brothers and sisters, every day is a risk. It's a broken world. We don't hide in our homes. We don't shelter in place every day. We go out. We assume risk. You do it every day. We just don't always take risks for Christ. Some would look at men like John the Baptist, Pete Fleming, Roger Yoderin, and think it's a waste. You know what I think is a wasted life? If you haven't done so in a while, write down Numbers chapter 13 and 14 and read it this week. That's a wasted life. It's an embarrassingly wasted life. God's people, the Israelites, are enslaved in Egypt, and God, uh, through his miraculous intervention, he spares his people, he moves, he redeems his people, he brings them out of Egypt into the wilderness, taking them to the land that was promised to their ancestor, Abraham, and he's taking them there, and they're on the cusp of going in. And in Numbers 13 and 14, Moses says, I'm going to send in 12 men to go spy out the land that God has told us is ours. And the 12 men go out, and they come back, and they give a report, and and Caleb and Joshua, they say, look, man, there's some big dudes in there. We ain't going to lie. There's some big dudes in that land. But God told us this is our land. Let's go take it for him. And the other 10 men look at Caleb, and they look at Joshua, and they say, no, those dudes are huge. We're like, we're like grasshoppers next to them. They're going to slaughter us, and they're going to kill our wives and do who knows what to our children. We should have gone back to Egypt. We should have never left. 
We should just stay right here and play it safe. Most of you know what happens next. God says, that's fine. For your disobedience, you will wander in the desert until every one of you from this generation has died. And for their disobedience, they get 40 years in the wilderness. Now, Numbers chapter 1 opens up and a census was taken. That's why it's called Numbers. Bad pastor joke. At lunch, someone will go, oh, I get it now. Twelve tribes of Israel, they counted them in. Men fighting age 20 and over numbered 600,000. Just the men 20 and over, 600,000. The desert is now littered with thousands and thousands and thousands of graves. You don't want to walk in obedience to God. God says, it's fine, just stay right here until you die. Men and women who played it safe, who were afraid to step out in faith with God, who aged and died in the desert as others waited on the promises of God. That was their legacy. That's a wasted life. Men and women who had entire generations saying, we can't wait for you to die because your disobedience has left us here. That's their legacy. The guy I've actually felt the most sorry for in the Bible that I have never had named is the last dude who's alive in that generation. Could you imagine being that guy? I, I couldn't imagine. Like, like, you wake up this morning, you come out of your tent, you stretch, and everybody's got daggers looking at you. Hey, Elijah, how's your dad today? He's good. That's a shame. I'm not going to lie. That's a shame. I was hoping for a bad report. Hey, Matt, some of us are going for an after-dinner walk. You want to join us? I'm good. Stay right here in my tent, right? Like, I mean... There's thousands upon thousands of people who are waking up every morning with one thought. Is he dead today? Because when he is, we get to go. That's his legacy. An entire community waiting for you to die because you played it safe. They were content to throw their life away in the desert. That's a wasted life. How do I avoid this, right? How do I walk out these doors and not waste my life? How do I walk out these doors and ask, what should my life look like? Because I read scripture and I see people like John the Baptist. They're not doing anything, they're not doing anything supernatural. It's just walking in obedience to God. Men like John the Baptist. Women like Queen Esther who simply risk their life by going before the king on behalf of their people. Men like Daniel who simply go and pray boldly before the Lord when prayer is outlawed in the community that they're in. Men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who rest firmly in the Lord when death awaits them for disobeying a king's order that disobeys the Lord's order. What move these ordinary men and ordinary women for God? These are just ordinary people in everyday life walking obedience to God in a broken world. That's it. That's it. Ordinary people in everyday life walk in obedience to God, letting the Spirit lead them in a broken world. How do I anchor myself boldly for God like this? How do I walk in obedience to God in the midst of a broken world day in and day out? Truth is, you're not afraid to take risks. Some of you probably bungee jumped. Some of you eat sushi. I love sushi. We ride our bicycles on busy streets. We send our kids to school. We go to the store. You take a risk every day. How do you do this for God? Take your Bibles and turn over to Philippians 1. I don't want to talk about another man who's in jail. Philippians chapter 1. We're in jail again. And it's Paul. And he's writing to the church at Philippi. Paul has seen what governments do to followers of Christ. In fact, before his conversion, Paul was one of the guys who would do things to followers of Christ, would have them arrested, would have them killed. Paul has been beaten. 
He's seen beatings. He's seen death. He's aided in death. This doesn't stop Paul from proclaiming Christ, and it's landed him in jail, just like John. But Paul is excited. Paul's not a sadist, but he's excited. Because in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, he tells the church at Philippi, because I'm in jail, more people are sharing Christ, and people are coming to know Christ because I'm in jail. Praise God. He's in prison, and he's in rejoicing because his imprisonment has led to more people hearing and surrendering to the gospel. And then listen to what he says in Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 19. I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart, to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and join the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to see you again. All right, how do I say anchored in Christ and move boldly for him? Let me just give you three things real quick that Paul talks about here that I think really is the backdrop of people like John and Esther and the five men in Ecuador, right? Paul says first, look at verse 19. I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul has a firm trust in Christ. He trusts that Christ will deliver him. But if you look at verse 20, as it is my eager expectation hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with my full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul trusts that Christ is going to deliver him. He's either going to walk me out of this jail or he's going to take me out of this jail and I'm with him. I'm either out of this jail and I'm still going to preach for Christ or I'm home with Christ. Either way, Paul says, I have a firm trust in Christ no matter the outcome. He holds in his hand and I trust him. But look at verse 20 because this, this is the thing that really moves Paul. It is my eager expectation hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul says, my greatest fear is not dying. My greatest fear is that I will do something to shame Christ. That's how men and women set the world on fire for the gospel. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not a sadist. But my biggest fear is not death. My biggest fear is that I will live and I will do something to shame the gospel. That's a bigger fear to me, Paul says, than going home to be with my Savior. Paul says, look, I don't have a death wish. But Paul says, I'm in a win-win situation here, literally. If I live, I get to honor Christ. Praise God, that's a win. But if I die, I don't lose. I also win. Look at verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He doesn't look at death as loss. He doesn't look at death as a waste or a tragedy. He says, I gain Christ, which is far better than anything this world has to offer. You believe that? More important than my safety, more important than my 401k, more important than an exotic vacation in retirement, more important than my children getting to the right school or the right team, more important than any of that, is I don't want to shame Christ with my life or my death. That's what sets the world on fire for the kingdom. I'm rooted in the finished work of Christ. He has paid for my sins. He has filled me with the Spirit. He's transformed me from the kingdom of sin to the kingdom of God. And with the Spirit now indwelling me and leading me, I walk in obedience to him because I've moved from an enemy of God 
to an adopted child of God all through Christ. And if you have not surrendered your life to Christ, I implore you, as Paul would the Corinthian church, be reconciled to God. If you don't know what that means, talk to somebody who brought you here. Grab me. Stop by the Connect table. We would set up a time. We'd love to talk about what it means to be reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. It's, it's as the modern hymn says, all I have is Christ, right? I'm not going to sing it. You don't need that pain. It says, all, as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And behold, I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, you my rans- use my ransom life in any way you choose. Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my soul forever be my only boast is you. Brothers and sisters, don't be afraid of dying. Be afraid of being an unmarked grave in the desert. That's a wasted life. Paul says, I can do this. Verses 22 through 26. Because he grasps a very certain future in Christ. If I live sweet, I preach Christ. If I die, if you should take me home at an age that seems young or tragic, I haven't lost It isn't a waste, it's gain. It's gain. Brothers and sisters, that you would see that God's promised kingdom is greater than anything this world ever has to offer you. How do I move in light of this? I'll give you a couple of ways to be praying this week, this month, and the weeks to come. How I'm thinking through this for my own self. I want to spend time praying John 17, 15 through 16. That while I'm in the world, I would not be of the world, but that we would be salt and light. We should be praying to the end, asking for wisdom and how our life can count for the glory of God in our work. Now, this isn't a call for you to quit your job and go into ministry. Some of you, it may be. Many of you, it's not going to be. And there's nothing dishonoring about that. Your prayer isn't that you go to work, but that wherever you're working, you take God with you to work. Your prayer is that you take God with you to school. Your prayer is that you take God with you to your sport practice or your band practice, or you fill in the blank. Parents and grandparents, your prayer is that your children don't go to school, but they take God with them to school, and that you are pouring Christ into them. Pray that we and our children would move with integrity. Our attitudes and work ethics would not be a stumbling block. We need to be praying for wisdom and how we can use the resources God has used, given us for his glory. And finally, I would encourage you, as I have been praying as a father for many years, to pray open-handed for your life and for your children's lives. They don't belong to you. They're God's children. You're stewarding them. Pray to that end. Hold them open-handed that God would be glorified in them. And if God calls them, encourage them. If God calls them to move to another place, encourage them. America needs doctors and teachers and nurses and architects. The world needs doctors and teachers and nurses and architects. In some countries where the gospel needs to be known, it's easier for doctors and teachers and nurses and architects to walk through those borders than it is for a pastor or missionary. Hold them open-handed and show them that Christ is gain. Some called Operation Alka a waste of five young lives. The reality is the impact can never be measured. Operation Alka actually began a few years before the men spotted anyone from the plane. You see, a few years earlier, Rachel Saint, Nate Saint's sister, met a young woman named Dayuma. Dayuma was a Wadoni, and she had fled from her tribe as a young girl due to an attack on her family by a fellow member in her tribe. And through God's providence, Dayuma met Rachel and taught Rachel about the Wadoni tribe and language. And it was Dayuma, Dayuma who taught the five men some basic language in 
Wadoni so they could make contact. After the five men died, two years later, Dayuma, Jim Elliott's widow, Elizabeth, Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, and Nate's young son, Steve, all went to live and gained access with the Wadoni tribe. Through their time and years in the Wadoni tribe, they translated the Bible into Wadoni. Within the tribe, several people, many people, came to receive Christ as their Savior, including many of the men who were in the attack of those five men back in 1956. One man, Minkaya, was a tribesman who treated young Steve Saint as his own son, as his adopted son. After Minkaya came to Christ, he confessed to Steve it was him who killed his father. And it was Steve who said he forgave him and was part of God's providence. Through what the world called a tragic waste, God used to bring countless Wadoni into his kingdom. And shortly after the death of the five men, an increase in world missions took place within the U.S., leading to conversions around the globe that this world will never know how to estimate. In 2014, at the age of 90, Dayuma went to be with the Lord. She's buried today with Rachel Saint, Nate Saint's sister, in the jungles of Ecuador, just outside the Wadoni village, near the site of the death of the five men. Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's widow, called Dayuma the preacher because she was the one who led many of her people to Christ. One enduring legacy from this account is not just the death of these men, but of their determination to live boldly for God. A few years before his death, Jim Elliot wrote in his diary, October 28, 1949, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Brothers and sisters, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and look at men like Paul, look at men like John, look at men and women like Nate and Jim Elliott and Elizabeth Elliott, Lord, and Diuma. And, and Lord, it would be easy for us to simply say, be like them. Yeah, Lord, it's not a call to model them. It's a call to follow in obedience to Christ as they did. Lord, it would be easy for us to put them up on a pedestal as if they're members of a spiritual hall of fame. And yet, Lord, we're reminded day in and day out that they move by the means of ordinary grace, rooted in your word, rooted by the Spirit indwelling them, just like we have the Spirit indwelling us and rooted in your word. Lord, help us to move boldly for your glory. Help us to live open-handedly. Lord, help us to come to the end of our lives, whether those days are 20 years, 60 years, 80 years, 12 years, 100 years. In the end, Lord... May we see that to die is gain. And may our legacy be that we lived boldly for Christ, that we risked boldly for Christ, that the kingdom was glorified in and through us. Lord, we pray all this in your son's name. Amen.